I felt over here about this particular pastime that it was more that okay, sorry. Just, yeah, okay. perfect. Okay, it was there can be apology, which is which we are which we seek because we are we are aware that we have done something wrong, and there is an apology which we seek because we are afraid of the consequences of what we have done. <laughs> <laughs> the two are not the same thing. The second thing, like what I saw, uh, hold, uh, like a, a cartoon somewhere, where some person was driving above the speed limit. So the cop pulled, caught him and pulled him over. He said, didn't you see the speed limit? Yeah, I saw the speed limit. I just didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> in general it is that, uh, most of the time, even when we, f we apologize, it is more often because of the fear of the consequences rather than thinking that I have done something wrong. So, of course, at, at the very least, apology is better than no apology. But if you're apologizing for the wrong itself, not just to avoid the consequences, then that's better. So, considering that Indra keeps repeating the mistakes, <laughs> you know, whether he really recognized that what I had done was wrong, or is really scared of the consequences, because of which uh, he is he's gone to Vishnu and uh, Vishnu is asking him uh, Prutha to ask for forgiveness. So we don't really know that very clearly from the context. But it could very well be that it could be the second case where he's just afraid of the consequences. And in that situation, the apology is sought and the apology is given not so much because the other person is wrong and is admit, ad, ad, feels that I have done wrong and is ready to repent. Sometimes the apology is given just so that some social order can be maintained. Mm. And if there's some antipathy is there, then that necessarily creates tension. So Prutu is a very powerful earthly king, Indra is a very powerful heavenly king. So the tension between them, the Prutu about to raise his weapons against him, that would have been very detrimental. So just even if the other person does not recognize that they are wrong, still you forgive them because okay, at least they are aware that there are bigger people than me involved and I cannot just get away with this. So sometimes uh, you know, we, may, we may have to forgive not because the other person is, uh, not the other, because the other person is uh, wrong and they are, they are really seeking apology. It's like you know, there is something which is right and then there is the right beyond the right. The right beyond the right means that sometimes our, our love should raise us above the need to prove ourselves right. Whenever we have an argument, no, you are wrong and I am right and I am going to prove it. Yes, it may be factually that we are right and the other person is wrong. but sometimes for the, our love for that person or love for someone else who is intervening our, the test of our love will be that in every argument we can we don't have to prove that I am right even if I am not right even, or even if I am right and the other person is wrong no need to insist on it sometimes we may have to let small battles go so that a uh, bigger purpose can be served so in this context, whether Indra is apologetic is not that clear or genuinely apologetic. But just to maintain the overall order, there is this Vishnu has come and through Vishnu, Indra is seeking apology. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, there can be really lousy apologies. Can anyone think of an example of a really bad apology? Really bad apology is something like, well, if you're offended, then I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right? But uh, this is, you know... On, That's on called technically a, a, a non-apology apology. apology. Yes, <laughs> it exactly, is. Exactly. <laughs> here, yeah, look, please, no, please here are six things you can maybe remember, because apologies can be very powerful if they're done properly and for the right reason. Right? And um, this is not from a, a devotional um, source, but a, a colleague of mine in my field wrote that these six 
components of an apology. And she said it doesn't mean that all six have to be there every time, but it's just something to keep in mind. First, that like a common understanding of the nature of the offense. You know, yesterday when I spoke to you on the phone, I said, right? And then the next step is taking responsibility for that, right? I should have chosen my words better, or, you know, taking some responsibility. And then maybe acknowledging how it may have hurt the other person, right? It's, you know, it's really understandable that you would be upset with me. And then you may make some judgments on yourself. That was, you know, that was really, uh, I was insensitive. That was a mistake on my part, right? And then express some regret, you know, uh, I'm sorry for my words. But I think one of the most important things is the last one is uh, what you will do in the future. So it's one thing to say something, but, you know, actions speak loud, louder than words, right? So, you know, um, in the future, I will try to think more carefully before I say something, something like that. Um, and then, you know, um, uh, it's, it's really important, as we're going to learn in many places, I was talking to Prabhuji about this yesterday, that um, when we offend devotees, especially exalted devotees, then, like, everything in life can become unsuccessful. I, you know, Indra didn't stand up when the Haspati entered the uh, entered his presence, and because of that, the demigods kept on losing to uh, to the to the asuras because they were respectful to Supercharya. Right. So then, someone asked. Uh, I was with Giri Swami once, and someone asked him, "Well, how do you overcome offenses to someone that you're no longer in touch with, or just in general?" And he said. Uh, he said, because we, we're so prone to commit offenses, um, in, in the morning program that we have at the temple every single day, um, Prabhupada instituted that we, we say this prayer to all Vaishnavas. And he said, that way, you're just kind of like begging the whole universe of Vaishnavas for forgiveness. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, yeah. Apologies when done properly, um, and even as Prabhu is saying, even if not done perfectly properly, are better than usually better than nothing. Any thoughts on apologies? Yes, your microphone. We record all these things. So. Mm -hmm. on sound yes, <coughs> Prabhu. Um, it reminds me of. Uh, the principle of four R's that are mentioned by Jaya Dev Maharaj, uh, recognize, regret, rectify, and reinstate. Uh, so yeah. recognize that I have made a mistake, and sincerely regret specifically on what mistake I made, and rectify that mistake, and reinstate back your original mm. proper behavior. Nice, nice. Other thoughts on apologies? Anyone ever have an apology that you didn't accept? <laughs> <laughs> right. Or do anyone know people like uh, who apologize all the time? They say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's kind of like the cry wolf syndrome that you have to while you think, well, this person isn't really that sorry. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Especially teenagers, they always say, I'm sorry. Let me keep on doing the same thing. You're not a teenager. Are you a teenager? <laughs> Are you 18 yet? <laughs> You're not 18, okay. <laughs> you're 11? God, you look older than that. No wonder you're so happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're on uh, verse number three. O oh, king, one who is advanced in intelligence and eager to perform welfare activities for others is considered best among human beings. An advanced human being is never malicious to others. Isn't that an interesting statement? What does malicious mean? With the acting with ill intention. That's a good definition. Yeah. An advanced human being is never malicious to others. Those with advanced intelligence are always conscious that this body, material body, is different from the soul. And uh, although this wasn't in the reading, I highlighted the last two sentences of the purport. One who is both devoted and highly advanced in intelligence does not take action against the soul or the body. 
Somebody has a very interesting ringtone. <laughs> Um, if there is any discrepancy, he forgives. It is said, this is an interesting sentence, it is said that forgiveness is a quality of those who are advancing in spiritual knowledge. So we heard the point about apologies, now we're hearing the person who receives the apology, uh, the importance of forgiveness. And of course we could speak, well, we could have a, like a Mahatma Prabhu as a whole four hour seminar or t- eight hour seminar on forgiveness, so we won't get into it. But Prabhu, anything you would like to say about forgiveness? I'll forgive you if you don't have anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard, I've never found that you don't have anything to say, so. <laughs> okay. I think that needs to be forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm. Forgiveness. What I've seen is it has three aspects to it. It is in terms of the action that we do. It's second in terms of the emotion that we have. Mm -hmm. And third is in terms of the intention. So sometimes in certain situations, certain corrective action may also need to be taken. In fact, our scriptures, they, they both center around a war, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So there are some situations where Forgiveness as an action becomes untenable. I mean, we're just talking about maliciousness. So, I've learned to differentiate between weakness and wickedness. Weakness and wickedness. So, weaknesses all of us have, say, lust, anger, greed, envy, pride within us. And at that time, sometimes they just overpower us and we do something wrong. And afterwards, we ourselves regret it. I should not have done it. So, that is weakness where our intelligence and conscience are still active, but they are sometimes overpowered momentarily. But wickedness is where the intelligence is used by the weakness. The intelligence becomes a servant of the lust, the anger, the greed, and the conscience becomes almost deadened. So Duryodhan, he had no regret that he had tried to dishonor Draupadi, that he had stolen the uh, Pandava's kingdom. And its insolence was when Krishna came, he said that, what? I will not give you enough land even to put the tip of a needle through. Now there are different ways of saying no. So we, say, <laughs> we invite somebody for a program and they say, no, I am busy here, I have this engagement so I can't come. That's one kind of no. But that person says, even if I die, my dead body will not come to your program. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very different kind of no. <laughs> so, it's not just a no to the request, it's a no to the person itself. So, Duryodhan had that kind of no. So, when there is wickedness, at that time, forgiveness as action is foolishness. Hmm. When somebody has wickedness, they will just destroy, keep destroying others. So, sometimes at the level of action, we may have to take the seek the Pandavas did not really seek revenge they sought justice so so forgiveness as action has to be applied contextually but forgiveness as emotion and as intention emotion means that I don't hold this against you See, if we don't forgive if you're not forgiving then we are essentially resentful and that emotion of resentment keeps burning us. So in that sense, an unforgiving attitude hurts us more than it hurts the other person. So as emotion, even if somebody has done something terrible to us, it's not that they, they, it's not that they are right, but that this holding on to it is not good for us at all. So in terms of emotion, to understand that Sometimes bad things happen in the life. Sometimes we can say it's, as Prabhupada would say, it's an instrument of our own karma. So we need to let go of that emotion. And as far as intention is concerned, that is also that if we are, if we are not forgiving it. So basically now the emotion of forgiveness will take time to come. Because if the hurt is very deep, then if we have been betrayed by someone, it's not easy to say I forgive, to actually forgive. But at least the intention of forgiveness can be there. So if we say like, if I have a rash, 
Now the rash to heal will take time. But at least I have to stop scratching it. If I keep scratching it, it's never going to heal. So intention means at least I want to forgive. It's not possible for me to forgive right now. Because sometimes some wounds are so deep that it's, it's uh, almost, it requires superhuman effort to forgive. And sometimes some time also has to pass for some healing to happen. So at least as intention, we need to always want to forgive. Now, as emotion, whether we are able to forgive or not, and as action, what we actually do, that will depend. As emotion, it may just take time and context to heal. And as action, we really have to think how best sometimes you know, we have to create a safe distance so that that person doesn't hurt us again. Here also, I like to differentiate between forgiving and trusting. Now, forgiveness can be given, but trust has to be earned. Now, if we gave some money to someone and they just wasted that money or stole that money or they squandered that money. And I said, we may say, I forgive you, but if you give them money again, we'll be, we'll be, we might again be cheated. So forgiveness is for the past. Trust is for the future. So forgiveness should always be given, but trust will need to be earned. Any, any examples you can think of of uh, forgiveness in the Shastra when someone forgave someone or didn't forgive someone? Um, Krishna forgave Indra after the golden pastime. Right. Yeah. Yes, uh, Jiva? Yes. Oh, we only have one because we have the two mics here. We only have one roaming mic today. So there is an example in uh, Ramayana when Lord Ram crosses the sea and comes to Lanka. He sends the message that I'm ready to forgive Ravana. Oh. If he comes and apologizes, he returns Sita. That's so again, that's why he's yeah. another you know, picture. And it's, it's a great example. And it actually opens the door. If a person who is in a position to forgive keeps that open heart, then the person who's asking for forgiveness is more encouraged to ask for forgiveness because he knows that he will be handled properly. It's nice. not that his apology will be known. Now, sometimes people do misinterpret that Ram was forgiving to Ravan but not to Sita and it was not Sita's fault to go to Lanka and the issue was taken. But then that's part of the Rama and the Pali. Yeah, so we can get into that whole different, discussion. Different, <laughs> different discussion. So it's yeah. not a situation of apology and forgiveness there. Thank you. Thank you. Other, other examples? I have an extension of this. Like okay. From what we said, I have a question. So uh, the extension was that when uh, Vibhishma came to uh, surrender to uh -huh. At that time, uh, that, uh, he asks, uh, I mean, Subliva goes and tells Rama that you should not trust him, he is right. like, betrayed his brother, so he might betray you also. Right. Uh, at that time, Rama says that, uh, like he listens to everyone, and then he says that, uh, according to ancient tradition, uh, if the enemy comes to you and says that he uh, surrenders to you, even if he is surrendering to you uh, with a bad intention, you should still accept. Um, so even if Ravana had come, I would have forgiven him, but uh, he says. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mahama, Mahama Mantra Prabhu. All these Shastrik Wallas and Wallis. So, uh, my thoughts went to Jaya and Malai. Ah, good example, yes. Um, after uh, being forgiven, Madan's repentance was so genuine and it reflected in their behavior too. Uh, afterwards, they, when the people started threatening them, them with the stones, they used to collect and cook them. Right. Well, it's interesting because you might consider, you might think that their initial repentance was based on the consequences yeah. <laughs> because they had a choice. Sudarshan Chakra, or, <laughs> you know, it was a... Uh, yeah, the, but then Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya uh, hugged them afterwards, and yes. that's when he said, he, actually, the, at a visual level, they became, Lord Chaitanya became dark, because yes. it said all the sins came into him. So, Adhita said that Gaura Chandra has become Krishna Chandra now. So, I think they, they, their heart transformed over there. Maybe not because of Sudarshan Chakra, but because of the Lord's mercy coming through the... That's the ultimate... Transformation. Yeah. yeah. There was another hand? Yes, cool. Uh, 
was going to say what you said, uh, oh. the Lord's mercy, like when, even when Ram killed Ram, it was like a redemptive action. Like oh. afterwards, he, he, he forgave uh, Ram, oh. and then he was liberated. And in time. that sense, what about Pallad Maharaj, right? He, he, after everything his father put him through, he asked that he be benedicted. It wasn't exactly, that was kind of forgiveness, yeah. All right, let's sally forth. Let's keep going. Um, if a personality like you, did I read that one? No. No. Who is so much advanced because of executing the instructions of the previous acharyas, is carried away by the influence of my material energy, then all your advancement may be considered simply a waste of time. Those who are in full knowledge of the bodily conception of life, who know that this body is composed of nessings, Desires and activities resulting from illusion do not become addicted to the body. And probably, let me just see where I had a few notes here. Um, Prabhupada writes, uh, in the bodily conception, when we think that sense gratification will help us, we are in illusion. Another kind of illusion is to think that one will become happy by trying to satisfy the desires that arise from the illusory body or by attaining elevation to the higher planetary systems, or by performing various types of Vedic rituals. All this is illusion. Similarly, material activities performed for political emancipation and social and humanitarian activities performed with an idea that people of the world will be happy are also illusion because the basic principle is the bodily conception, which is illusion. Prabhupada uses the word illusion a lot in those <laughs> few sentences. So I was thinking, um, uh, pro, you know, he's, there's so many verses one could think of that uh, apply to this. Yehi sansparsa japoga dukkha yonaya evite, that uh, one who's intelligent doesn't try to connect the senses with the sense objects. Because um, they, they, from the beginning to the end, they have, they have a beginning and an end, and therefore a wise person doesn't delight in them. Or, um, any, anyway, we could think of so many. Um, verses, but I was thinking about this last point about material activities performed for political emancipation and social humanitarian activities. And somehow I was thinking about how sometimes people, not only in India, we do, it's done around the world, is that people will do, let's say, fasting, right, for social causes and things like that, right? Um, and uh, and Mahatma Gandhi did that, and uh, other people did that. But here it's stated that really austerities should be done really ultimately for spiritual advancement and uh, for the pleasure of the Lord, right? So we have an example right here that we're reading about. We have an example of someone fasting till death, Maharaj Pariksit, right? But of course, first of all, he knew he was going to die in seven days. And he was doing it only so that he could fully absorb himself in hearing about Krishna. But doing such things for other purposes kind of misses the point. Right? Uh, even the idea that, uh, you know, even for social, even for, you know, taking care of the ills of this world, the example that's given in the Shastra is that if you pour water on the root of the tree, the tree flourishes. You know, if you, if you could imagine, like, if you wanted to water each leaf of a tree, like with an eye drop or something, that wouldn't be a very good way to take care of a tree, right? So, similarly, um, although in India sometimes they'll say, what do they say? Manava Seva is Madhava Seva? Yeah. Actually, the Shastra says, Madhava Seva is Manava Seva, if anything. That when you please the Lord, then, then the, the world flourishes. Uh, more. Not that we shouldn't also, like we do uh, pr uh, Food for Life, where we distribute prasadam to, um, to homeless people in D.C. Not that we don't take care of people, but primarily um, by pleasing Krishna, by pleasing God, um, the world flourishes. Anything you want to say about that? Yeah, you know, I have... You've probably written a, lot. a book about it. <laughs> Not He's a book. like, uh, how many books? 25. 25 books. So, um, I've written 25 sentences. All right. <laughs> mm, I, so, <clears throat> some people find this uh, almost dismissive attitude towards anything in this world. Mm. Now, humanitarian activities aren't they good? Mm. Even or 
other activities to do good in the world. What's wrong with them? It's not so much that they are wrong. It's just that they are wrong when they are seen as an equivalent substitute or a superior substitute to spiritual activities. If you look at the worldview before the scientific revolution in 16th, 17th century onwards, almost everywhere in the world, whether it is India, Middle East, in the West also, people had this understanding that this world is a transitional place. And there is some other world where we are meant to go. The specific details of that conception may vary. But the idea was this world we live through so that we can attain another world. But since science and especially technology started <coughs> transforming Give this, yeah, right. thank you. Transforming the world around us, more and more people started thinking that actually, why do we need any other paradise? We will create paradise in this world itself. And now the hope is still there through technology we will create a paradise. Mm. So, ideally speaking, it is this world and that world, especially if one follows the Vedic program of Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha or of Paravidya and Paravidya, we can have welfare in this world as well as the other world. So, it's not that in the, in the Vedic tradition people did not give charity, people did not give. Now, when we have the, in the Bhagavatam itself the example of Antidev and Shibu, Marashibi. And there is no direct devotional context. Somebody is coming and uh, animal is asking for flesh, for the flesh. A bird is asking for a flesh, or dogs are being fed at the expense of one feeding oneself. So it's not exactly that. They, of course, the kings there were very devotionally spiritual, but it's not that you go hungry and we will do our worship. It's not that these two necessarily have to be in competition. This world and the next world. If we live this world in a holistic way, that means with holistic understanding, in Sattva Guna or in a devotional way, then we can do welfare in this world as well as pursue the other world. And that's what I'll give the example of mid, uh, food, food, level, food for life. What we are doing essentially is we are taking care of people's bodies but also taking care of their souls. But most humanitarian activity today is intended to make this world itself a happy place. And many times that starts deterring people from pursuing anything higher in their lives. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the, the spiritual teacher or the, uh, who coined this idea, Manav Seva, Madhav Seva, he, he made many, he was very derisive about the bhakti tradition. He said, you Indians, why do you water Tulsi? It's so useless. Now he's supposed to be a prominent spiritual leader in India. He said, what do you get by watering Tulsi? If at all you want to water something, you water an eggplant tree. You will get something to eat. So he basically started saying that his whole bhakti business, worship business is all useless. And that's why our Acharyas have also strongly responded to that. So it's not that Manav say that we want Manav to be starving and we will just worship Madhav. No, if you are worshipping Madhav, there is a whole culture. There are so many temples in India which provide free prasad, free food to people, free prasad to people. So we can do Manav Seva in a Manav Seva is included in Madhav Seva. But somehow in today's world, in many cases, I saw the slogan of one humanitarian relief organization. Its slogan was God in double quotes. God sends calamities, we send relief. <laughs> no, it's not God who is sending that. It is, it is our own, whatever reason we want to say, it's definitely not that God is the cause of the suffering in the world. So th this attitude is what our Acharya is condemning, that if we get so caught in fixing things in the world, that there is no time or thought to fix things beyond the world, or to fix ourselves so that we can go beyond the world then our pursuits in this world become the enemy of our pursuit beyond the world. So the example uh, which can make this clear is like if you have a person in pain, you need a pain medication and you need a curative medication. So material efforts are like pain medication. So if somebody is in great distress, you need to give some pain medication. 
But if you start thinking the pain medication is giving you an and I'm feeling relief. Why do I need any curative medication? That is very dist distressing. That is very dangerous. So any effort that materially resolving things, it may be required in certain times. It's like when extreme pain, pain medication is required. But that shouldn't become the purpose of the hospital. That shouldn't become the purpose of the patient. And that certainly shouldn't become the purpose of the doctors. So if nobody else understands, that's also OK. At least the doctor should understand that the pain medication is not the purpose. So, but what has happened when spiritual teachers also talk, start talking about material welfare alone? Then who, who, who is ever going to talk about spiritual welfare? So that's why our acharyas, when they seem to be condemning in some way uh, any material welfare work, it is not that they are against that work. It is that that is being positioned as an alternative and in fact a superior alternative to spiritual welfare. And that's why it is being strongly critiqued. Some thoughts on this point? Um, I was thinking about the same point and you gave a very beautiful example of the pain medication and the, the, the material welfare activities is like a temporary relief activity and the real intelligence is to find the root cause of the problem and solve that problem. And that's where the spiritual welfare comes into mm. being. So spiritual welfare includes the material welfare as well. So that would be a more complete package. Yes, perfect. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, I might be wrong, but... Uh, I doubt it. <laughs> Sorry? He said I might be wrong, but I say I doubt it. Okay. <laughs> many, of the, uh, many of the welfare organizations uh, the main purpose behind the root root cause is either the name or fame, and if you remove the name and fame that uh, they are going to uh, get, then I don't think anybody would come forward to do the welfare activity. That's what I was. It, it I guess it would. It's an individual thing. Yeah, because there are three modes. Sometimes people in passion, if they do welfare, they do welfare work. They definitely are very conscious about name, fame. Without that, there is no reason for them to do it. But there could be people who are in goodness and they can do some welfare activity. But just as overall in the population, the number of people in goodness are relatively less. So even among welfare activists also, people who do welfare are less. And the atheists nowadays are very aggressive. So what happened was the church in trying to counter this increasing irrelevance of the other world. Because as I said, the whole ethos was through technology you make this world better. The church also started positioning itself that what is our contribution to society? So we are doing so much humanitarian relief. So the churches sometimes they 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 have orphanages, they give free free food. They, of course, they all have a covert or overt agenda to convert, but still they do that. So many atheists now have also started giving charity. They say charity is not just because you are religious. And in some countries, especially in the, in the European countries, the atheistic charitable organizations, they actually do more charitable work than the religious organizations also. And that, uh, that is often motivated by the desire that it's not that you have to be a religious person to be a good person. Even atheists can be good people. Now it's possible that atheists can also be good people in the sense that their functional values are good. They may be honest, they may be kind, they may be sensitive but they don't have any fundamental basis to their values. So I wouldn't make a categorical statement, although it's uh, quite likely that people are motivated by the desire for fame and name when they give charity. And this is in the news right now because uh, after the fire in Notre Dame, I had so much money came in, They're up to seven or eight hundred million dollars, right, just in a few days. And now they've come under criticism. Of course, in, the, in Kali Yuga, everyone criticizes everyone. I mean, standard, right? But they come kind of under criticism that, okay, you're giving $100 million to rebuild Notre Dame, but when we ask you to, to donations to feed the poor, you don't give a penny, you know, or a euro. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's a topic that's front and center right now. Yeah. yeah. Well, we also say that, we also say that, uh, um, in, in ISKCON sometimes that comes up, right? Because we want, we're trying to, Prabhupada wanted, Lord Chaitanya wanted the temple in Mayapur. And we also want to take care of the devotees and we want to, you know, uh, 
um, distribute prasadam and, and you know so we have uh, thing that, uh, one thing I always I found in ISKCON uh, or yeah, in, is that there's never enough money because we have unlimited things we can do right we could we could have temples every five miles we could distribute a gazillion books we could have festivals all the time we could distribute prasadam to everyone you know we we, we Prabhupada gave us such big ideas uh, that we could do so much for Krishna. And th there's that example that uh, uh, when I think Prabhupada was in Hong Kong and they showed him a picture of a sadhu who uh, they, it, it was a big stack of rupees. Remember in the old days, you know, rupees would come in these big stacks, you know, you, you know staples in them of 500 rupee notes, right? And that's, you know, so it lacks and lacks in front of him. And the sadhu was, put his hand behind his back like this, you know. And Prabhupada said, you can take a picture of me going like this, <laughs> and then I'll use it all for Krishna. Not a paisa for myself, but everything for Krishna. So that's, uh, that's our uh, theory, that uh, nothing in this world is material in the sense that uh, we can use everything in Krishna's service. Shall we move on? Yeah, just one point about this comparing. Uh, whenever done, so much money has come for rebuilding the cathedral in Paris. So anytime a comparison is done like this, there is some agenda for emotional manipulation. Mm. There was a, there were two movies which had come in India. There was one uh, OMG and later there was PK. Both of them were satires on religion. Gotcha. And this was uh, this was um, whole religion. You spent so much money on worshipping images in the temple, but you don't see God and the poor people starving on the streets. So, they're quite uh, devastating critiques of religion. So I had written two books this morning to that. OMG re-answering the question and then PK was the second movie. I had written GK for PK. <laughs> so, <laughs> GK was general knowledge, God knowledge, Gita knowledge. <laughs> so, anyway, so one of the points that were there was that, I mentioned that if you want to compare, then why not compare with 100 other things? Just the amount of money that is present in, uh, that is spent in the European Union and America on cosmetics mm. is enough to feed all the hungry people of the world. Or why go even to cosmetics? In India itself is supposed to be a poor country, but the amount of money that is spent on cricket in just one tournament, the IPL, <laughs> you know, just the IPL, the amount of money that is spent over those 50 days is enough to feed all the hungry people in India throughout the year. So if somebody likes to try to manipulate by comparing here and here, uh -huh. well, it's 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 an agenda-driven comparison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Thank you. <coughs> La last weekend, Gita and I read, I had an interesting conversation with a student. Okay. He was asking about what's your view on him. It's not you. Okay. So I said abortion is a bad move. Okay. So but what we deal with that, how and where we deal with it is at the root. The desire to commit the sin. So that's why we follow this for related in schools okay. and education. And uh, you know, diplomatically he said, oh, yeah, that's nice. But he, I know he was not convinced. But then the next day he came and uh, then he said, yes, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, mm -hmm. I was thinking like the spiritual take care of him, takes care of those tendencies to commit this kind of activities, not just like atonements or something, you know, or helping the victim alone, but you know, you know, the perpetration level. They, they, they help eradicate those tendencies. So. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Okay, let's move on to text number six. Is that right? Yeah. How can a highly learned person who has absolutely no affinity for the bodily conception of life be affected by the bodily conception in regard to house, children, wealth, and similar other bodily productions? The individual Next, next verse. The individual soul is one pure, self-effulgent 
And though devoid of material qualities, the reservoir of all good qualities, all pervading, not covered by matter, that witness of all activities is completely distinct from other living entities and transcendental to all embodied souls. Although within this material nature, one who is thus situated in full knowledge of the Paramatma and Atma is never affected by the modes of material nature, for he is always situated in my transcendental loving service. The Supreme Personality of God of Vishnu, Lord Vishnu, continued, My dear King Prithu, when one situated in his occupational duty engages in my loving service without motive for material gain, he gradually becomes very satisfied within. Prabhupada writes in the second paragraph, Everyone is situated in his occupational duty, but the purpose of material occupations should not be material gain. Rather, everyone should offer the results of his occupational activities. A Brahmana especially should execute his occupational duties not for material gain, but to please the Supreme Personality of God. So one time, um, someone asked Prabhupada, and of course this was a certain time, place, and circumstance, what is the most important verse in the, in, 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 in the Shastra? And he, he quoted uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 2, Verse 9. Dharmasya hi apavargasya. Artho artha yo pakalpati. You know this? Yeah. Go ahead. Dharmasya apavargasya. Nartho artha yo pakalpati. Narthasya dharma ikantasya. Kamo labhaya ismataha. So he says all occupational engagements are certainly meant for ultimate liberation. They should never be performed for material gain. Furthermore, according to sages, one who is engaged in the ultimate occupational duty should never use material gain. To cultivate sense gratification. So, you know, if he was asked another time, he might have said another verse. But he was trying to, you know, talk to this person and say, your activities ultimately you should do them for God's pleasure, right? And that's kind of what Prabhupada is talking about here, that um, per that the purpose of material occupation should not be material gain. Rather, uh, everyone should offer the results of his occupational activities, because we all have God-given abilities. Everyone. And so those God-given abilities should be used in God's service. And that's actually, in one sense, the essence of Varnashrama. And well, the Varna part of Varnashrama. Right? In one sense, it's very simple. Although there's all these intricate rules that you might find in, in different places, really, uh, you have a natural tendency and you use that to please Krishna. Now this was particularly... There is a, I just mentioned also, there is a traditional progression of dharma, artha, kama and moksha. So what these two, this was 1.2.9 and 10, what they are saying is, dharma should not be done for artha, artha should not be done for kama, and kama also should not be for moksha. But rather, all these should be ultimately for the purpose of bhakti, for the purpose of spiritual attainment, for liberation. Dharmasya, apavargasya. Apavarga is liberation. So you could say it's just bypassing artha and kama and going toward moksha. But the Bhagavatam defines moksha in terms of bhakti. So dharmasya apavargasya nartho artha yopakalpya. So it is not this correlation dharma to artha, but dharma to transcendence. Then narthasya dharma ikantasya kamo labhaya israta. And it says artha, don't use it for kama. Hmm? But how should we do then? That artha, the well that we have, dharmasya ikantis. That when we are doing our dharma, whatever artha we get, we use it for transcendental purpose. For the then the next verse says, kama. We all have desires, so it's not it's not said that we give up desire. Kamasya na indriya pritir. That don't use your desires for gratifying the senses, but yeah, jivo labhe tayavata. Use, yes, you get what, it's not that we have to starve, but get what is necessary for survival. And jivasya tattva jignasa, nartho yascheha karma bhi. Jivasya tattva jignasa, that life is meant for inquiring about what, uh, what is life, what is the purpose of life. So, you know, it said that the purpose of life is a life of purpose. <laughs> the purpose of life is we have to live a life of purpose, of spiritual purpose. So, and then jivasya tattva jignasa nartho yascheha karma bhi. And here the word artha doesn't refer to wealth. The last artha refers to meaning. 
that there is no other meaning, meaning and purpose. Iska artha kya hai Hindi mein se? What is the meaning of this? So there should be no, there is no other meaning to life. So in that sense, the Bhagavatam, in some ways, it transcends even the Vedic hierarchy of Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. It doesn't deny that, but it says that there is a higher purpose to all of it. So Dharma, Artha, Kama, all of them are meant for transcendence. Right. Yeah, I was at a Gujarati wedding yesterday, uh, and the, the priest was talking about Dharma, Artha, Kama, but he didn't mention Bhakti. I felt, like, I felt like raising my hand, but I thought, no, probably not during the uh, wedding. I thought it would be a good idea. Unless <laughs> <laughs> I could say it in Gujarati, though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't see. Isn't uh, Bonnie Wait, get a microphone. We have to hear your transcendental voice. Uh, I was thinking that moksha. Hold it like karaoke, yes. Uh, I was thinking that moksha means uh, bhakti. So, uh, well, uh, so I now you'll be enlightened. <laughs> so does moksha mean bhakti? Yes, of course, ultimately. It's a, different people have different conceptions of the same thing. So there is a word which is like a term and there is a concept. Concept is inside us. So concepts are, we could say mental, words are verbal. And there has to be a link between the two. So the example I use is that, say if you have a suitcase, the suitcase has a handle. Without the handle, you can't lift the suitcase. But sometimes, if, if I once I had my suitcase broke down when I was traveling, so I went to another place, I was leaving, so the devotee gave me another suitcase. They said, just, it's difficult to fix it now. So then when I came to the next station and came at a carousel, because I had not handled the suitcase much, I forgot what the suitcase looked like. So I only remembered that the suitcase had a red handle. So all the suitcases with the red handle, we were taking out and seeing whether it is my suitcase. <laughs> so the point is that so the same handle can be attached to different suitcases. So like that, the same term can refer to different concepts. So generally the word moksha in the broad Vedic context refers to uh, disconnection from the world, liberation from the world. But what beyond that? Many people think that that refers to just getting into some kind of oneness, merging into the infinite oneness and losing one's identity. They say that Liberation means you get into such meditation that that you are not even aware that you are meditating. Hindi में कहते ऐसा ध्यान करो कि किसका ध्यान कर रहे हैं कैसे ध्यान कर रहे हैं ये भी ध्यान में न रहे. That's how they say. So that's you know, that's not the Bhagavatam's understanding. Bhagavatam's understanding is that yes, there is that oneness beyond. But beyond that oneness, many people talk about this diversity and unity. Unity and diversity. But Bhagavatam says, beyond the unity, there is also diversity. There is a unity of the Brahman, but beyond that, there is a diversity of personal relationships and transcendence. So yes, the Bhagavatam says that moksha ultimately doesn't mean just what we are liberated from, but what we are liberated to. So we are liberated to a life of love with the supremely lovable object, Krishna. So in that sense, Moksha culminates in bhakti. But not everybody who talks about moksha, moksha is necessarily talking about bhakti. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. We, we should just keep Prabhuji around all the time, yes? <laughs> yes. Is this okay for you? You look like you're the youngest representative in the class today. Do you want to say anything? No? You're being very, very patient. I'm super impressed with you. When my son was 11 years old, he would have been get out of here, let's go, come on, this is crazy, I'm so bored. You're being so pukka. Very nice gentleman. Maybe in his mind. Too, in his mind. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good, he's not saying though. <laughs> Very nice young man. Okay, so we're on verse uh, 10. Thank you. When the heart is cleansed of all material contamination, the devotee's mind becomes broader and transparent and he can see things equally. At that stage of life, there is peace, and one is situated equally with me as Satchit Ananda Vigraha. Anyone who knows that this material body made of the five gross elements, the sense organs, the working senses, and the mind is simply supervised by the fixed soul, is eligible, there's your word, liberated, liberate, to be liberated, moksha, from material bondage. 
Lord Vishnu then told King Prithu, My dear king, the constant change of this material world is due to the interaction of the three modes of material nature. Uh, we heard about that, right? Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas. The five elements, the senses, the demigods who control the senses, as well as the mind, which is agitated by the spirit soul, all these taken together comprise the body. Since the spirit soul is completely different from this combination of gross and subtle material elements, my devotee, who is connected with me in intense friendship and affection, being completely in knowledge, is never agitated by material happiness and distress. And Prabhupada writes in the beginning of the purport that the question may be raised that if the living entity has to act as the superintendent of the activities of the bodily combination, then how can he be indifferent to the activities of the body? The answer is given here. These activities are completely different from the activities of the spirit soul of the living entity. A crude example can be given in this connection. A businessman riding in a motor car sits in the car, supervises its running, and advises the driver. He knows how much gasoline is used up, and he knows everything about the car, but still he is apart from the car and is more concerned with his business. Even while riding in the car, he thinks of his business and his office. He has no connection with the car, although he is sitting there. As a businessman is always absorbed in thoughts of his business, so the living entity can be absorbed in thoughts of rendering loving service to the Lord then it will be possible to remain separate from the activities of the material body. This position of neutrality um, can be possible only for a devotee. Any thoughts on that? So, well, isn't that a wonderful, uh, very interesting, you know, of course you have to probably, it would be good to spend a little time in India to understand this, right, because um, not too many people in America have chauffeured drivers. I've right? been in India, everyone, even middle class people have drivers, right? So it's really, it's something you can easily relate to if you've been in India, which I've lived for 21 years, right? Because it's very, you know, the person sitting in the back of his car, the driver's in the front, he's doing his business. We have Uber now. What's that? We have Uber now. We have Uber now, right? So there you go. <laughs> Uber is the closest thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's better, it's not your car, right? <laughs> yeah, actually this vision can uh, decrease the distress that we can feel when things go wrong in our life. Mm. We will inevitably, say even if we are driving in a car and our car gets punctured, that, that's an inconvenience. But it's, uh, and definitely it needs to be attended to. But it's not the same as say our hand getting fractured. So uh, just as we will be concerned and we will want to fix if a car is punctured, our car is punctured, but we won't be so disturbed as if our own hand were fractured. The same dynamic applies as we become more and more spiritually advanced. That even if things go wrong with our body or with our material situation, it's an inconvenience and we need to fix it. But because we, do, we are not so emotionally, personally invested in it, a certain amount of distance, yeah, this is my body, I need to take care of it, but it's different from me. So then we don't get so disturbed by it. Mm. So there is a, I think in Harishauri Prabhu's uh, Transcendental Diary, there is a description that when Prabhupada was in Mayapur especially, and when he would do, when he would have his massage being done, so the devotees doing massage would say that if, if there was anybody else with whom Prabhupada was talking, then Prabhupada would be very conscious. But if nobody was there, then it was like Prabhupada would not be, would not be at all externally conscious. And I think it is Harishwari Prabhu or Shudakriti Prabhu, they write that. We felt as if you know, Prabhupada had left his car with a mechanic for servicing <laughs> and he had gone to the dham to look around in the dham to be absorbed over there. So that, uh, that's some inkling of what it could be like to the extent we can remember that I am different from the body, I am different from the uh, situations around me. They, 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 are of mat they are of concern to me, 
but they are not something which are like a personal threat to me. So we may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. With pain means, yeah, it's, it's a vicarious puncture, it's a, it's a pain. But it's not that it's going to consume my consciousness completely. So basically the spiritual understanding expands our consciousness so that pain, even if it is there, it's a component in our consciousness. But if you have only material understanding, then our consciousness is at the same level as the pain. Then rather than pain being a component in our consciousness, pain becomes the container of our consciousness. We are completely in pain. So it's not that as we become spiritually advanced, the material uh, doesn't matter at all. It's not that we don't care for the material, but rather we are not consumed by the material. It kind of remember, I think we've talked about this before, but the philosopher Hegel talks about thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Yeah. And it's kind of like that. So the, the you know the the thesis is what most people in the world think, right? I I, I am this body. I'm I'm born in this family. I'm I'm this gender. I'm all those things, right? Uh, and life is really meant to um, to enjoy either individually, family, society, like that. Right? And then the antithesis is just this. Um, as Prabhu was saying, this kind of lower level of moksha, where you know. No, this world is a place of illusion. I'm not this body. I have nothing to do with this world. It's just, a, and so I should go out to the forest and you know meditate, but I have nothing to do with this. But the antith the, the synthesis is to take the best of both of those and take it to a higher level. And that's bhakti, where you are active, as in the original one, but in knowledge, like the second one. So acting in knowledge and then adding bhakti, uh, devotion, and that's the synthesis. And that's uh, kind of what's being said here. It's also um, about this example of the motor car. And Krishna also talks about this in the eighth chapter of the Gita, where he says, tasmat sarveshu kaleshu mamanu smara yudhicha. He tells Arjuna, you do your job, but always remember me. Right? So uh, having that... Uh, um, so he, said, he, he, told, he didn't tell Arjuna to, actually Arjuna kept on saying, I want to get out of here, go to the forest, <laughs> meditate. And uh, as they say in Brooklyn, uh, Krishna kept on telling him, forget about it. <laughs> You're not going to do that. Uh, you have to stay and do your duty. So, but in a different consciousness. Uh, Mama smart to remember Krishna. Anything on that? Shall we move on? Or? Please. Okay. Thank you. So we're on text 13. He's already, Shiva Tab is so organized that he's way ahead of me. He's already got the next verse lined up. My dear heroic king, who's he speaking to? Who's speaking? Just checking to make sure you got it right. <laughs> Please keep yourself always equipoised and treat people equally, whether they are greater than you in the intermediate stage or lower than you. Do not be disturbed by temporary distress or happiness. Fully control your mind and senses. In this transcendental position, try to execute your duty as king in whatever condition of life you may be posted by my arrangement. For your only duty here is to give protection to the citizens of your kingdom. So it's, it's um, I like this point where it says whether they are greater than you, intermediate, or lower than you. It's... It's, uh, all, it's often very easy to be very respectful of someone in a big position, right? It's what, what to speak of your boss at work, right? But can you be equally respectful to someone who you don't, you can't, you don't, there's nothing that they can give you but just because we respect all living entities, right? The, the sweeper in the street or whatever. Um, that's sometimes, as they say, the, chit, the test of a gentleman or a lady is that they could be respectful to all. Okay. Did you want to say anything? Yeah, and it's just two thoughts over there. Generally, material consciousness means we think what that other person can do for me. And then within that, if, if that other person is superior to me, then they can give me something. If nothing, they can give me trouble if I don't respect them. So, <laughs> so then we may respect them. But spiritual consciousness means that 
not what the other person can do for me, but what I can do for the other person. Mm -hmm. And if we have that service attitude, then every person is an opportunity for us to ex exercise that service attitude. Every person is an opportunity for us to connect with Krishna. So in that sense, spiritual consciousness makes it easier to respect everyone. Because we don't have, sometimes spiritual consciousness can be misunderstood and we think, oh, this person has fallen. And then we may become more disrespectful, thinking that a person has fallen. But that is not spiritual consciousness, that is actually the, it is the ego associated with spiritual consciousness. Mm -hmm. Spiritual consciousness is where we respect everyone, seeing that we can, that they are all parts of Krishna. And by being courteous to them, by being uh, just polite to them, we can give them an opportunity to come closer to Krishna. So, do you respect your teachers? Yeah, why? Uh, because they teach you. Because they teach you? Okay, <laughs> Good answer. Do you respect your mom? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> That's honest. Why? Honest. <laughs> Ah, yeah. <laughs> like my son respects me, I think because he thinks I'm a walking ATM machine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have good mo pretty good motives. Not completely pure, but you're getting it. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next. To give protection. So here Lord Vishnu is giving the king some instructions on how to be a good king. Oh, I didn't see. Oh, here's another. Do you respect your parents? Also, <laughs> you guys have been uh, talking before a class on how you're going to collaborate with your answers. <laughs> to give protection to the general mass of people who are citizens of the state is the prescribed occupational duty for a king. By acting in this way, the king in his next life shares one-sixth of the results of the pious activities of the citizens. But a king or executive head of state who simply collects taxes from the citizens but does not give them proper protection as human beings, has the results of his own pious activities taken away by the citizens in exchange for his not giving protection because he becomes liable to punishment for the impious activities of his subjects. Is that my phone? No problem. No problem. Um, and the purport probably writes, the question may be raised here, that if everyone engaged in spiritual activities to attain salvation, well, I'm sorry, the question may be raised here that if everyone engaged in spiritual activities to attain salvation and became indifferent to the activities of the material world, then how could things, uh, how could things as they are go on? And if things are to go on as they ought to, how can a head of state be indifferent <coughs> to such activities? So sometimes uh, over the years, because uh, I've been doing this for so long, and probably this has happened to other devotees. Somebody would say that to me, right? I may be dressed in dhoti and kurta and be out in an airport or, or, um, or in having a kirtan out on the streets or whatever, and someone would say, what would happen if everyone just was a Hare Krishna like you? Right? And who would, who would uh, you know, who, how, who would run the electric company and who would, you know, build houses and who would, and, and um, Sometimes I've seen devotees who aren't um, very kind of sharp in terms of argument, they would say, oh, it would be wonderful, everyone would just be dancing. <laughs> so this is called, in logical fallacies, a straw man. They're trying to present a straw man argument, right? And it's important when you hear a straw man argument to not run after the straw man, right? Because the, really the proper answer, as we're seeing here, because Prabhupada is asking the same question, right? He says that uh, if everyone became indifferent to the material world, how would the material world go on? Right? But we say that, well, that oh, of course it's good to, to chant and to do spiritual practices, but Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, karma ladikara state mahalesha, that we should all do our duties. All do, and so someone will, they'll still be IT professionals, don't worry, everyone, half the people in the room are probably IT uh, <laughs> or whatever, or physicists or things like that. Right? Um, so, so I was just, just when this came up and Prabhupada said that uh, here, uh, I was thinking that, no, it's not that uh, the Shastra tells us that we all just become sadhus and, 
and there's nothing, nothing going on in the world. No, practically the world will continue. It will just be much nicer. Right? Because people will be respectful to each other. People will... Uh, we, we understand from Shastra that even if, the, if there was a decrease in the killing, unnecessary killing of animals, right? Especially the cow, but all, but all animals, um, they, then so many things would improve in this world just by Krishna being pleased by that. So um, it would be wonderful, but it doesn't mean that uh, you know, we have to we'll go back to living in caves and things like that. Some thoughts on this? Yeah, actually, again, two points. First is that there is no reason for us to, as they said, said the straw man argument. Straw man argument is where you misrepresent the opposite person and how can you believe this? So, quite often, say, when I'm in university, somebody says that, I don't believe in God. So, first question is, which God? No, all of them. Okay, but what is your conception of God? <coughs> Once you ask this question, and they will have some strange understanding, and when they complete that, I also don't believe in that God. <laughs> so, what we have to do is usually take people's, before answering an argument, we need to challenge that argument sometimes. So bhakti is very much inclusive spirituality. It is not reclusive spirituality. Reclusive spirituality is where we go out of the world and we just become otherworldly. Yes, there may be a few renunciates and few devotees who might be doing that. But overall bhakti is inclusive spirituality where we understand that God is not just existing beyond the world. God exists in the world also. The 18.46 in the Bhagavad Gita by your work worship him a prominent Gita commentator translated this as work is worship now that is not what Krishna is saying if work is worship then the donkey would be the greatest worshipper <laughs> so yes that doesn't mean that now work is worship is fine as an ethical principle that all work should be given some dignity of labor. But work is worship is not a philosophical principle. That if work, were, if work were worship, then what is the difference between the two? Worship is where there is a connection with God. And that connection is not intrinsic to the work. That connection has to be infused in the, into the consciousness of the worker. So to the extent we do some direct devotional activities, to that extent, that service attitude will come into our work also. And then actually, the workplace and the work culture can become better. Even in, a, even in a place where we have to do work, if everybody is in Rajas and Tamas, it becomes very competitive, degrading, and the performance cannot happen very well. But if people are in Sattva, relatively speaking, then even work can happen better. So, if you look at the Indian tradition, there have been so many great achievements from this world's perspective. The Mahabharat is the world's longest poem, 110,000 verses. It's more, the two longest poems in the Western history are considered Iliad and Odyssey. And the Ram, Mahabharat is, both of them combined together multiplied by seven. Yeah. Surely now lazy people couldn't have written such a long poem like this. People who are just otherworldly, they wouldn't have it. It's a work of literature. So there are many things, many advancements in material knowledge that also happened in the Vedic tradition. So people are not just otherworldly. It is that once we have the other world as life's ultimate purpose, then we can function in a more mature way in this world. If this world alone becomes our life's purpose, then we start grabbing and possessing at all costs. And by trying to make, if we make this world our life's ultimate purpose, ultimately we make this world into hell. Because we become so competitive and possessive about everything. But if we, some other world beyond this world is the purpose, then we can function better in this world also. Okay. Thank you. Some thoughts on this? Okay, go ahead. So, uh, what we have been talking about until now, I don't remember the verses like what he said, but in one of the chapters, I don't even remember the chapter, and Krishna says that uh, you are, I mean, it is not that you have to artificially detach yourself 
right. from your bodily activities or anything. But when you attach to me, then all of these automatically follow. And then in the purport, Prabhupada provides and the saying that it is like uh, Krishna is saying that uh, if it is like a child. So a child is crying uh, because uh, his toy is broken or something. But then the mother gives him something uh, like some sweet. Uh-huh. So she makes him interested in something higher than just the plate. And he gets extremely interested in that and this attachment with the toy automatically diminishes. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, the same way uh, our activities in the material world will automatically be re- more regulated uh, if we are if we, if we make that connection. Yeah, that's the whole principle of higher taste. It's, if you just think I have to give this up, give this up, give this up. Giving anything up is painful. Mm-hmm. So bhakti is not so much about giving things up, it is about taking things up. The Prabhupada was able to establish the whole Krishna conscious movement across the world, not just because he was the greatest renunciate. Yes, he had extraordinary renunciation, but some of his god brothers were like renunciates throughout his life. So more than giving up, Prabhupada took up, took up the mission of his spiritual master. He took it up more than anyone else. And to the extent our consciousness is filled with Krishna, to the extent illusion will have no place over there. Our lower desires cannot be driven out of our consciousness, but they can be crowded out of our consciousness. If you try to drive out, get out, get out, get out. It won't work. It will keep coming back again. But if we fill our consciousness with something else, something more constructive, something more uplifting, then they get crowded out automatically. Thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, connection to that, uh, to that Apichet Sudhura Chava. Uh-huh. So, that verse and the verse after that. So, like initially, when you just read that verse, Apichet Sudhura Chava, Krishna is saying, uh, even if the person is performing the most abominable sin, uh, if he is my devotee, you should think of him as a great sin. Right. So when I read that verse, I was like, why, why would Krishna say that? But if, when you read the next verse, he says that a person who is like that, who has say, committed some great sin, but he is in the path of bhakti, then very soon his actions will be regulated and he will be transformed. Correct. So hmm. that connects. To yeah. But you're bringing up a really important principle as Prabhuji, you know, this whole idea of a higher taste. The example I like to, the, the example I like to give is, uh, like, so I have a 2005 Toyota Prius with about 200,000 miles on it, right? So I take really good care of it because it's the car that I have, right? And, it's, uh, and you know, and I, I change the oil and everything, and, you know, I take good care of it. But if someone, but if you would have just, like, Say, oh, Prabhu, here, take this, and the keys to a brand new uh, Tesla. And all of a sudden, that 2005 Toyota Prius is like... <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> so relevant. Huh? <laughs> I'll never even think about it again. <laughs> right? I get a car that doesn't need gasoline, and it's, mm. you know. <laughs> right? so, so it's easy. So right now, because it's the only car I have, right? Oh, I take very good care of it, right? But if you give me something better... You know, jello. <laughs> right, so that's a little bit like if we only think material life and material desires and, and getting more and keeping up with, uh, you know, the, the Joneses, as they say in America, or keeping up with the Agarwals if we're in India. Uh, if that's, you know, if that's, if that's our only purpose, we can get quite absorbed in that. But if we get a higher taste, um, but if we get something much better, then it's like uh, insignificant. So how are we doing time? Oh, we still have a few more minutes. We end at 12 for those, uh, you know, um, so we'll take a couple more. Any other comments on this? Yes. Uh, yes, Shiva Tapu. Thank you, So the spirituality is all inclusive. That's, that's like coming from the Shasta itself. And so if you look at it, means any point by Mother Gita or Krishna says with their denies and burn a drama later in the first thing. Shunin Cheva Shopakuja from Gita Samadhi. 
So you understand, not just human beings, everyone. So that's very inclusive, not just like, you know, only human beings have a God. Everyone has that supreme personality of God, that is the Lord. When you decide as a person, everyone's heart. And when you look from that very perspective, and then you connect to the one and the Chatur Varna Maya Shatam, Guna Karma Vibhavisha. And now the karmas could be in different varnas, but then if you're focusing on the supreme personality of God in the center, then you are transcending the more so material nature. So you may be doing different activities, like you know, Rajan is fighting as a Kshatriya. And Lord Krishna is saying, think of me while you are performing it. It's more of a service than you fighting for your own glory and name. It changes the whole perception. Nice. Thank you. So the last two sentences, we, we, like, I, like I've always said, we don't make um, political statements here. But I think you can, if you scan the world, you can see that uh, something that was written in the 1970s is still pertinent today. Prabhupada writes, These subtle laws of nature are unknown to the present leaders of society. Since the leaders of society have a poor fund of knowledge, and the citizens in general are rogues and thieves, there cannot be an auspicious situation for human society. At the present moment, the whole world is full of such an incompatible combination of state and citizens, and therefore there is constant tension, war, and anxiety as an inevitable result of such social conditions. So, you know, it's so, the ideals, uh, that are, uh, the ideals of government that are mentioned in the Shastra are so far from reality today, it's, it's hard to even, like, relate to them. You know, imagine a a president or a prime minister or a king uh, who is truly a saintly person and their only purpose in, in life was to protect and care for all the citizens, which includes the animals. Praja, uh, Prabhupada would often say the word praja, which means citizens, yeah. includes the animals. Um, and their only purpose was the welfare of, of the citizens and specifically the spiritual welfare of the citizens. And Prabhupada would even say sometimes that it's not like uh, if a devotee became the king of a country one day that they'd all have to chant Hare Krishna. They can practice whatever their faith may be, but, but they would be encouraged to practice that sincerely. So that is so far from most political realities today. And it's not like it also in the past where the citizens had such great respect for for the leaders, you know, now, you know, every late night comedian makes jokes constantly about it. <laughs> whatever. You, it, it, we're so far from the, uh, from what we read about in the Shastra, it's, uh, it's scary a little bit sometimes. Any comments on that? Yeah, it's said that, I think it was Winston Churchill who said that a democracy is a terrible form of government, but it is better than all other forms of government that we know. So, yeah, we had in the past uh, a God-centered monarchy, but today we see that probably the places where we have freedom to practice our, our bhakti as, is the places where there's some kind of democracy. So it's uh, overall, the point I'm making here is that uh, there is an increasing shifting of the locus of responsibility from some central authority to the individual that is happening in society and that is also to some extent something which we have to do in our spiritual lives you know, because uh, that there is no ideal government so i can't practice spiritual life no ultimately it's our our spiritual life is our responsibility and each one of us if we try to become more spiritually conscious, then we can make a difference. Prabhupada was just one person and he made so much difference. Of course, we are not Prabhupada, but by his mercy, we can also make some difference. So wherever there is a room for individual to make choices, and that is always there, just the magnitude of their choice may differ depending on the socio-political environment of a particular place. But by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy, by Shri Prabhupada's mercy, even though the government is secular or it is sometimes even anti-religious but still we can grow spiritually 
So it's like Kaliyuga, there is a reign of anarthas. But we have got an umbrella. With that umbrella, we can protect ourselves and we can invite more people into that umbrella. It's like a, we could say the umbrella that we have, the more we use it, the bigger it becomes. It's an expandable umbrella. As we grow spiritually ourselves, you know, more and more people can come under the umbrella. It's not we who are giving shelter because we have not produced the umbrella. It is Krishna who is given, and Krishna and the Acharyas have given it to us. But even amid such uh, darkness that we see in the world around us, still there is that opportunity for us to take individual responsibility, to grow spiritually and to provide others opportunities to grow spiritually. So we're, we are out of time for this week. Uh, I'll send out the homework uh, by email for next week. It'll be same time, same place. And just a reminder, Chaitanya Taranka Guru will be giving the, uh, the classes this, this afternoon in an hour from now. The topic is uh, nonviolence in speech. And we're very, very thankful to, uh, grateful to him and thankful that he's uh, come to Washington, that he spoke with us today. So thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Have a wonderful week in Krishna Consciousness. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Prabhu, the class was a